Back to this week's episode of the Mary Trump Show Strategy Session. There are 154 days left until the midterm elections in November. And uh, every week I have a panel on to ask one question. What can we do to make sure that the Democrats don't just win, but increase their majorities in the House and the Senate because everything is at stake. Tonight, I am so grateful to have as my guest the Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for USA Today, a New York Times bestselling novelist of the phenomenal book, Daughters of Erie Town, professional in residence at Kent State's College of Communication and Information, Connie Schultz, and uh, somebody who's already been a guest here, a uh, former CNN political commentator, contributor to ABC News, and former GOP communications director on Capitol Hill, Lincoln Project senior advisor, and co-host of The Breakdown, Tara Setmeyer. Welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, I want to start uh, with one thing, because it... It made me, it uh, clarified or crystallized, I should say, for me, the disadvantage Democrats have in terms of reach and messaging. Fox News is not going to air any, as far as I can tell, of the January 6th committee hearings on the insurrection. Um, this to me is just such an enormous structural disadvantage the Democrats have. And it seems that it's not just unfair, you know, we're all fighting with one hand behind, tied behind our backs, but that it's, it's just, it shouldn't be allowed. This is a network that claims to be a news program, and yet they are allowed to pretend that the biggest news, I think, in modern history isn't worth airing. So, Connie, what, what are your thoughts about that? And how do we get around those kinds of setbacks that we seem to face all the time? Well, I have a couple of thoughts, um, Mary. Having dealt with Fox readers for all 20 years of my life as a columnist so far, um, I feel pretty strongly that they're not the ones who are going to watch anyway, for the most part. They're not the ones who are going to vote differently. Those who could peel off are probably going to be interested more than they were even three weeks ago because of the shootings in this country. And I've been hearing more from those Republican voters in recent days. And I admit, certainly I'm, I'm grateful that they're thinking about it. I've been a little surprised by the numbers. So I never thought we were gonna get the Fox voters. When I say we, I mean America at this point, right? I mm -hmm. just think it, it's such a division. Um, so I'm not too worried that they're not going to cover it because I also don't trust that they would, not, that they would just run it without constant ongoing commentary about what you're witnessing or their so-called fact checking, which I don't trust at all. So I'm not too worried that Fox viewers aren't gonna be involved here. I, I want to push back just a little bit. I, I agree with you uh, in principle, but I think that it does send a message. Um, oh, sure. And again, I, I'm not making a play for Fox viewer. I completely agree with you there. I think, though, that it partially it is a, I don't know, FEC? No, FCC issue. You know, if you're allowed airtime, you should be, you should have to, as in the olden days, have to air certain things like state, states of the union addresses or what have you, and um, without commentary, just show it to your viewers. Uh, not because, again, we're going to get any of them, but because maybe, just maybe, if allowed to see this unfettered, they might learn a thing or two. Tara, am I, am I off base there? Or does it seem like this is not simply a question of whether a network has a choice, but that there should be at, at any rate, if you claim to be a news organization, to have an obligation to not your viewers, but to American citizens? 
Well, I mean, it's clear already that Fox has decided that they do not have an obligation to the American citizenry uh, or else they wouldn't push the propaganda lies that they push every day on their on their channels. Um, Lincoln Project put out an ad last year calling Rupert Murdoch the most dangerous immigrant on American shore to come to American shores. Uh, a lot of people thought that was hyperbole uh, until they realized how much influence this large propaganda machine that they have, that the Murdochs have, the influence that it actually has on people. With If there was no Fox News, there would be no Donald Trump. There would have been no right. insurrection. There right. would have been no big lie. None of this would have been able to metastasize the way it has um, without that megaphone. Now, you also run into to your point about, well, should they be compelled to do it? Or, you know, how come they, you know, back in the fairness doctrine days, uh, there are arguments over uh, whether that is a good or a bad thing. And uh, we could argue those merits again. You get into kind of murky territory with that when you start compelling. But if you're a news organization, there are certain standards. Um, and I think it would be interesting to revisit that, given that Fox News, more than not, it has no. It has left the left the news uh, uh, category. Uh, might except for maybe Brett Bear show. I, I don't know what else you would consider to be uh, news on that channel anywhere. Um, but you know what's in. I, I, when I think about that, like why wouldn't they? What are they afraid of? I ask. What are they afraid of? They're afraid of the truth. They're afraid that yeah. if their people were <laughs> actually sat there and had to watch and face the truth about what happened, yeah. um, what w there might be like a depro deprogramming of the cult, uh, almost like a Clockwork Orange. I think of <laughs> I think of the movie. You know, make them all sit there and watch it with their eyeballs taped open and see what happens. Um, you know, but, well, we know we all know how that ended. And I know, didn't. I know, it didn't end well. But I'm just saying, like, I think like I think of that image, like you know, what would happen if they yeah. were forced to watch it. And um, a couple months ago, I forget who did the research, but they had a, a company paid people to watch Fox and paid people to watch CNN. So like Fox new viewers had to watch CNN um, and vice versa. And it was interesting. It actually changed some opinions. Like they, there was news, things that they were learning about by watching CNN that they never heard on Fox News. And they were like, oh, well, that's different. I didn't know that. Well, no kidding. No shit. That's what happens when you're actually exposed to, you know, truthful, factual information. And then yeah. it counters a narrative that you've been fed. So, yeah, there's a reason why Fox News doesn't want to show the um, the hearings in, in real time unfettered, because it might actually um, impact people. And they might go, oh, wait a minute. That's actually what happened. They weren't Antifa. They weren't tourists. It wasn't just a normal day. They actually like tried to kill police officers and they wanted to hang the vice president. And, uh, oh, well, that's not the narrative we heard. Well, the video speaks for itself. Um, Mary, I, I, want, I want to build on what Tara just said. First of all, mm -hmm. what Tara's describing has been happening at Fox for decades. We right. remember the Iraq war in the lead up. And years later, there were still a certain, there was a certain percentage of Americans who believed that we had found weapons of mass destruction there, which right. we know now is a lie. And not coincidentally, they overwhelmingly were Fox viewers. Also, uh, and, I, and I understand your sense of fairness here. I understand why you think it's so unfair because it is, but we do not have those laws anymore that require right. them to air anything. For me, the conversation begins with, let's not call it a news organization. It's a propaganda machine, have. right? Yeah. I don't expect more of it than that. But it wasn't just Fox that helped Donald Trump get elected as a member of the mainstream media. Um, I You're love right. this profession. I've been in it for nearly four decades. There were so many org news organizations that gave him unfettered exposure at times. Did not. Ch I remember after he was elected, I was still in syndication with creators I, before I joined USA Today. And I had some papers drop me because I was calling him. I wasn't the only one, but certainly I felt strongly that we should be doing it, calling him a liar calling what he was saying that. lies. And we're watching all this hand wringing going on in newsrooms. Can we really say he's lying if we don't know what's in his head? I, I don't need to know what's in someone's head to I know agree. they're a liar. Just like I don't need to know what's in someone's head if they're physically abusing someone. The fact is they're abusing. The fact yeah. is Donald Trump was lying. We fortunately moved on from that. But those early months were, for me, really painful to watch at times in terms of the coverage. I would yeah. take it a step further than that, Mary, like mm -hmm. to Connie's point, 
Listen, I was a CNN contributor for six years and yeah. CNN played a huge role. Yeah. Jeff Zucker's decision to have a countdown clock with an empty podium every single time Donald Trump was speaking at a rally and then like the the like ad nauseum coverage of of the Trump rallies without like the real hard investigative holding him accountable type reporting yeah. for right. all of the stuff that he had done, which was proven, documented. They, they it was a show. Everybody saw this as a show. Les Moonves, um, he said, Donald Trump is terrible for America, great for ratings. That's right. And, and, that's, they, and that's what they did. And, and yeah. by the time they realized that they'd created this Frankenstein, this Frankenstein monster, it was too late. And so it's true that the, the, the mainstream media did help this along um, during the 2016 campaign. But, it, but Fox was, was what kept that fire going during sure. his presidency and that, you know, and then through the insurrection and the big lie and where we are now and COVID too, yeah. with the nonsense about, you know, it, it, ivermectin and, you know, bleach up your ass as a, as a brilliant idea that Trump came up with <laughs> somehow yeah. was, you know, get, get out of here with that. There, there was really no balance to hold him accountable for some of the more ridiculous and dangerous things that he was saying. Right. And, you know, the ground was so has been softening for decades too. Like we could go way back, but, um, there's so, and, and it also, it wasn't just, uh, decisions being made, um, at the top, you know, Joe Scarborough, and Mika, sorry, I can't remember. Brzezinski. Thank you. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> We're like hanging out at Mar-a-Lago. Oh uh, yeah. Giving Donald unlimited airtime while Hillary Clinton was giving substantive policy speeches. As you said, her, we were looking at an empty podium or a plane on a tarmac. Um, and Connie, I, I want to get back to something you said, because it, it is so important, um, given the fact that we have five months not to dwell over the unfairness, which I, I have to be honest, I do sometimes because it isn't just the fact that, you know, Fox is allowed to pretend to be a news network. Um, it isn't simply that um, all of the networks are allowed to um, not call a lie a lie. Not, I mean, it took over three years to call a lie a lie. I don't think they ever called his racism racism. So what are the chances they're ever going to call the Republican fascism fascism? I think they're, they're slim to none. Plus, uh, so, but it isn't, it isn't just that. I think one of the reasons uh, we get so frustrated sometimes is because the structural inequalities inherent in the system almost always seem to accrue to the anti-democratic minority. To the benefit of them. Particularly, yes. right? Thank you. I yeah, I forgot that kind of important word. Accrue to the benefit. <laughs> I wasn't um, trying to correct you. I was just adding on. No, you're right. <laughs> That's like it's an important word in that context. So, what are you asking? Uh, what I'm asking, well, I don't know if it's a question so much as something I want you to comment on. Just the, the state of frustration, oh, not sure. not on the left, but on on the on the behalf of people who care about preserving American democracy, or I, I should say the potential for American democracy um, at every turn. You know, we're, we're blocked by uh, the filibuster or by the quote unquote originalist interpretation of the constitution. Um, so it's, or the uh, electoral college. So, when on top of that, we also get this this very skewed um, take uh, by the mainstream media. Like there are certain rules apparently they have to follow in terms of being straight with their viewers versus telling the truth or just reporting straight news. Um, so I think that the danger then becomes um, that we get demoralized. Because well, there's no question of that. I mean, yeah. think of where think of where I'm sitting right now. I'm in Cleveland, Ohio, right in the city. And so when when I hear you talk about the unfairness, I'm not just thinking about Congress. And full disclosure, I think both of you know I'm married to Senator Sherrod Brown, U.S. Senator Sherrod Brown. But I'm looking at what's happening at state houses around yeah. the country, including right here in Ohio, 
Uh, we're, we're about to get uh, the governor's going to the Republican governor, Mike DeWine, is going to sign a bill. It looks like that. You know, yes, let's give teachers guns. The uh, redistricting commission four I think it was four times that has been told this is unconstitutional. And now they're going to use it anyway because time is running out. When you have those sorts of real time events happening, it is so understandable that voters are wondering why should they even bother? And I hear this from people who've been involved in civil rights for decades who, you know, on the ground activists, on the ground citizens are many of our neighbors who um, whose families came from the South, moved to the North during the great immigration, right? Um, wondering how could this be happening in America now? And you're right that it, we can get discouraged. Um, the activists, the, overall, the activists I don't worry about. They're just mad, they're angry, they're gonna keep going. What I worry about are the rank and file, yeah. the regular citizens who, Grew up believing you're supposed to vote. You know, I grew up in a union household. Uh, I was just telling my daughter-in-law the other day, I was so obnoxious my freshman year in college at Kent State. I carried voter registration forms everywhere I went. I was that person. It's amazing I ever had a friend. Um, it's just, you know, I grew up with this tradition of voting as so many like me in my generation did. And um, I'm hearing real despair in them. But I'm also hearing things like this. I go to the grocery store down the road and I'm standing next to a woman I've never met who cannot believe the price of eggs right now. And if we're going to talk about messaging, look, look nobody's, I, I'm certainly going to be watching the January 6th hearings. I have a personal investment in them in addition to being an American. I, you know, for yeah. 45 minutes, I didn't even know if my husband was safe. But the thing is, and as important as that is, we got to connect the dots that you should care about this because this is what democracy is about. And if you don't have the country you think you have, if you don't have the country you deserve to have, here are all the other things that can change because right. of that. To me, yeah. that is a crucial pivot in messaging that we have to be making, not just as you know, elected officials and candidates, but I'm thinking of so many of us who have the platforms, who have those microphones. How do we talk to readers? How do we talk to viewers? How do we talk to voters? to help them not despair. You know, I always think of the late Reverend uh, William Sloan Coffin, whose definition of patriotism, true, a true patriot is always having a lover's quarrel with this country. And let's change the pronoun with our country, right? That certainly yeah. defines my idea of patriotism. Yeah, I'm not sure a lot of people right now feel free to be outspoken about it. They have a lot more fear of consequences. They, uh, you know, for all of our criticism in mainstream media, I wanna say this as well. Many of my colleagues have worked at various news organizations really hard to tell the truth about Donald Trump, so much so. Yeah. And Tara, I'm sure you know some in the profession, too, who had to have this. An editor at one of the major news organizations told me that they had to hire personal security for a number yeah. of people, not columnists, reporters who mm -hmm. were covering the Trump administration. Oh, and yeah. I don't want us to lose sight of that. Absolutely. All of us. And I know you're not. I know you're not married. Yeah, and, oh, well, I, I mean, that, I can speak it from personal experience, yeah. uh, the attacks and, and some of the vitriol and, and threats that I've gotten against my life for simply being a, um, a liberated Republican and speaking the truth from day one about what was going on and then eventually deciding to leave the party. But the, uh, the FBI was on, was involved in a couple of the threats against me when oh, I was at sorry. CNN. Oh, that's okay. When I, and obviously it's really not. It feels like yeah, a rite of passage at this point. Yeah, at this I point, know, but, you know, but no, you're right. It's a, it's it's a shame. But um, yeah. I mean, I, I've always gotten um, nasty hate mail and comments for being a, a conservative, but this was very different. And like CNN actually had CNN security would escort me in and out of the building anytime I was in studio during the Trump years. Um, and I could never tweet out ahead of time until I was in studio when I was on air because we didn't want to give anybody enough time to come. They would know where I was. But thankfully, I have a, you know, I have a law enforcement husband. And, and so I'm, I'm very well protected at home. But the point is that this happens to a lot of people. And, and when you have and when you have false fake news, real fake news, right? Like, for example, last week, I was guest hosting The View. 
and I made a commentary about the rise in Christ violent Christian nationalism in this country, which is something that the FBI and our intelligence, DHS, everyone has been writing about this, talking about this, studying this for years, yeah. and how this is a problem with gun extremism, with the gun ownership side of things, and we're responsible gun owners, so it's not about the Second Amendment. It's about this actual rise in violent Christian nationalism and them justifying the uh, violence and gun ownership and all of that goes along with that with biblical scripture. And Fox News went and wrote a headline that said, co-host of The View, guest host of The View blames Christian nationalism for mass shooting in Uvalde. I never said any such thing. Never said that. We were talking about the gun manufacturer and the ad that they had uh, with, the ch with the toddler and the AR-15. Yes. And they have a, had a Bible scripture in that ad. And I, we were commenting on that. I never said anything about Uvalde, never said anything about mass shootings. You should have seen the threats and the harassment that I got for days and days after that. And Fox was contacted and said, you need to change this. This headline is not only is it inaccurate, but you know, there's threats now to Tara because of this. They didn't do it. They kept the headline and changed it to something very minor, which didn't change the meaning of it at all. But it Listen has this. real life consequences to this stuff. Listen, yeah, I, I just want to say to your audience, mm -hmm. listen to what Tara has just described. Armed security taking her in and out of the building at CNN, not tweeting where she was going to be. Threats, Fox refusing, even after it has been communicated to Fox, yep. that this is potentially dangerous, that this is endangering Tara and yep. they won't change it. This is, this is where we are now. This is different from previous administrations, mm -hmm. right? I mean... The Obama administration, we will never know all the threats the Obama administration got, but reporters covering the Obama administration and the columnists writing about it never got this level of threats until Donald Trump was president. That's right. And and I, I think it is really important to stop for a second because I think it's part of a larger um, problem. Uh, both Tara and I initially just kind of laughed at him. Yeah, well, what are you going to do? Yeah. A death threat, you know. Eh. It, 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 we, I think, I mean, I do that because I'm not, so many of us get them, right? That it does seem kind of commonplace. And by the way, everybody, it's all coming from one side. That's Democrats, correct. Democrats, people on the left are not threatening to murder people or, other horrible things, okay? Or, or hang or behead or, you know. Or go after their family. I mean, right. it's really one-sided and it is a big deal. I mean, I, you know, I'd never had my life threatened before. I'd never I, been doxxed before. I had pictures of my house put on the internet before. Um, so it is, it is not something that we should take in our stride, but it reminds me of what happens when the onslaught of horrors is so enormous and unceasing. Like we just can't take it in all the time. Like I can't, you know, we you get paralyzed, right? Tara, if you think too much about what that really means when somebody threatens your life and, yeah. and knows where you are, or you can't let somebody know where you are. Yeah, and I mean, I I think for me, because I, I, I believe very strongly that I have a, a, a calling to be a truth teller. And so things like that will not deter me. I look mm -hmm. at that. That's what they want. They want right. to shut down um, the other voices. They want to shut down the opposition. They That's what they want to do. And I, I, I refuse to let that happen. So for me, I'm like, Psh, whatever, you know, because you're not going to stop me. It's just too important to make sure that for, I want other people to feel the same strength that I've been blessed with so that they are motivated to speak up because not everybody has that in initial um, ability to go like, you're not going to stop me. Most people are like, whoa, you know what? I'm just going to stay quiet. I'm not getting involved. It's not worth it. And I have to encourage people that despite all of that, it's still worth it for me to do this. And it should be worth it for you because our democracy in our country and, and this great American experiment is worth the fight. Otherwise, the other guys win, and we don't want that. Absolutely, and we can't. It's a, It's like. A, it's. It's like hostage taking. You don't ever give in to the terrorists, and we can't do that either. My, my point is more, um, and maybe Connie, you can speak to this. Is that we kind of brush these things off and move on because 
otherwise we we get enervated by the horrors and and it seems like you know the media did that with donald it was almost like instead of being cumulative his uh crimes his breaking of norms his horribleness was uh substitutive like one horrible thing happened only to be replaced by the next and replaced by the next it never like all came together to matter in the way it should have and we see the same thing happening with uh people on the right calling anybody who's in support of lgbtq plus rights groomers mm -hmm. and pedophiles and it just never stops and and i see uh, elected democrats saying you know and this happened in virginia with critical race theory they they think that the best thing to do is not address it and i couldn't disagree more we have to meet these horrible sl slanderous lies head on otherwise it just sits out there and people think well you know if they're not rejecting it or if they're not fighting the accusation then i don't know maybe there's something there should we should we on the left like let these things go or well, no of course not of, of course not there you've just said a lot a lot of things are coming to mind here first of all when I hear them, for there's example, so much first, going on, right? <laughs> there is so much going on, and the republic, the the far right, is really good at name calling and coming up with horrific titles for us. But I, for so many years, it's still here. I've had it for more, more than two decades now. A quote by um, the late uh, black poet Lucille Clifton, who, in an interview with a colleague of mine years ago at the Plain Dealer, said, "What they call you is one thing; what you answer to is something else." And to me, that is such an effective mantra. When I give speeches, I often you see so many, particularly women's heads nodding because we've all been called those horrible, horrible names. The other thing that helps, I have found in the last few years, you know, what you're talking about is, correct me if I'm wrong, but part of it is how do we get out of this rage that we can feel from this? How do we not let it eat us alive? Right. And for me, it, I mean, I understand that. <laughs> we have many conversations like that here at the homestead. One of the things that has really helped me is to reframe it. It's never who I'm fighting against. It's who I'm fighting for. Yeah. And I find that so enervating, reinvigorating, right? Because uh -huh. it helps me stay centered. The other thing, you, you two are so, in my, my view, and many agree with me, you are very brave. You're talking about how you just don't let that hate get to you. I was not so brave in the beginning. And when I would give speeches early in my career as a columnist, inevitably, if it was a large room, you know, hundreds of women and they have the microphone and they can get up and inevitably someone would ask during the Q&A, doesn't it bother you all the awful things they're calling you? Doesn't it bother you all the hate mail they send? And I would say, no, no, you don't let it get to you. Well, that wasn't really working because first of all, that wasn't true. Yeah, It did get to me at times, right? Secondly, I wasn't helping anyone find her courage if I was setting myself up as somebody braver than everybody else. I'm not suggesting at all that's what you're doing. I'm saying in my experience, I suddenly understood that was not helping anyone, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I started admitting that yes, <laughs> yes, some of this really bothers me. I just don't let it stop me. Mm -hmm. And of course, this again was before Trump, before things got, I mean, it was always awful. If you, it, I don't need to tell you this, Tara, you write anything about race and I've been writing about Races in my entire career, holy cow. And all you have to do is say Hillary's name. Yeah. And, and when Rush Limbaugh was still on the air, I often could tell when he had gone after me on a show because I would get 300 emails within an hour saying yeah. the same thing in different ways, right? You just know all of a sudden they're coming after you. They're very organized. Yes, and really I, I think of Eric Alderman's book, what was that called? Where he talked about working the refs, what liberal media it was called. And he uh -huh. talked about how the right wing was so good at working the refs. In other words, they call the editor and they complain about what you're writing and they don't, they, not just them, they have 40 other people calling that morning and suddenly you're brought back down into the principal's office having to explain yourself because editors worry all the time as do owners of big networks, they worry about being accused of uh, bias. And I say this to my mm -hmm. colleagues a lot these days, if you are reporting facts, it's not our fault then. It's not, I would say it's not my fault that liberals are the only party that as a progressive, I'm pro-worker and the far right is not in their policies. I didn't create that partisan divide, they did. 
Right. I didn't create the partisan divide when I support women's reproductive rights. When I think a woman should have control of her own body. I'm sorry that's a partisan issue, but I'm not the one who made it partisan, right? right. We aren't the ones making it partisan by covering how divided the, the two parties are now on these issues. And I do worry that some of my colleagues, mostly because of editors who get, I'm very lucky not to have an editor like that, um, who get it, who are always hand wringing over the, their fear of appearing to be favoring one side over the other, when quite frankly, most of America actually agrees, not with the far right, right? right. They don't agree with the far right, but we don't give them sometimes the, the arena to express their views without immediately thinking we have to balance, balance it. Right. There is no balance to hate. That's There's true. only a rebuttal. There's not. That's yep. right. And yep. there, there are a couple of things I, I want to follow up with. Um, the first thing, and this really resonates, uh, and for me, and I think for Tara would say the same thing, it isn't fear. And now I'm just speaking for myself. For me, it's um, just be feeling overwhelmed. Um, you know, uh, as I've said many times, it is a terrible time to be a person with empathy. Um, yeah. And I, yet, I have a hard time admitting that I struggle because I don't want to. I don't want to feel like I don't want to let anybody down. But at the same time, like you said, Connie, that's like you're not then giving other people permission to feel the same way. Yeah. And you're making it seem like, you know, you always have to be strong. You always have to be on it and you can never let your guard down. Uh, so we do, I think we do need to treat this like a relay race, um, not a, not a marathon where we're the only person running, yeah. you know, we can hand off, we can tap out. Um, and the other thing, Tara, that I think is so incredibly um, important is for people on, and you know what, I don't want to say left anymore, pro-democracy people, because yeah. that's it. It's not left, right. It's right, wrong. It's democracy versus autocracy. It's democracy versus- On this issue, for sure. Right? Okay. So I, I, I uh, speaking of feeling overwhelmed, I made the great mistake of rereading Dark Money, because uh -huh. <laughs> I'm a masochist, apparently. But it's an incredibly important book. Everybody should read it. Um, and it, it, it just, when Connie was speaking, it reminded me of that, the story that book tells of how organized, how this entire, this very tiny cadre of exorbitantly wealthy, cruel, clueless people have taken over. And, and she talked about the way they set things up at um, universities as beachheads, which is just such a, an evocative and kind of terrifying phrase in this context. But she's right. And then the the rank and file just fall in line. We on the we do not have that on the pro-democracy side of things, you know, the side of things where people actually think that corporations aren't people and ridiculously wealthy people should pay their more than their fair share or whatever that fair even means at that point. I say bring back Eisenhower's 90% tax rate. But so what what can we on our side of things do to counter that or what how can we help people understand that there's really very little organic on the anti-democracy side of things, that it's very calculated and it's it's choreographed by this tiny, tiny cabal. Yeah. <laughs> well, as someone who used to be in the middle of all of that um, on the yes, conservative side of things, I I look at it now through a much different lens, and I go, yeah. oh my god, you know, when I used to go to Council for National Policy meetings or CPAC or you know when we would go to to Paul Weirich meetings. And I, I never thought about that the people behind this that were funding this were actually part of a cabal of- um, Yeah, you thought it was about policy. Yes. You know, that's what brought me to conservatism and had nothing to do with all this other stuff that's going on here. And I'm like, well, I, the, the, the conservative intelligentsia doesn't exist anymore. And that's unfortunate, but that's a, that's a different discussion. But what, the, what, what Republicans did, which, which was genius, is that they created that boogeyman on the other side. It was George Soros. 
right? So while they were doing what they were doing with the Koch brothers and Sheldon Ailson and um, uh, uh, the, um, what's Melon his name? States. It's the Cambridge Analytica, uh, the funded Ted Cruz in them, Rebecca Mercer, the Mercers. Yeah. I mean, you, now you have Peter Boss. Thiel, right? That's right. Now you have Peter Thiel with his yeah. money and his nefarious, um, you know, beliefs that, that democracy doesn't work anymore, which he actually wrote in his book. Um, these people were, you know, are all involved with tens of billions of dollars funding these things. And what were they doing? Messaging one thing. George Soros was the boogeyman, no matter what it was on the left, constantly. To this day, people still talk, still refer to George Soros, the Soros funded fill in the blank. Right. Republicans um, are the ones now that have all of this going on, that are funding all kinds of things, and, and that, but they're all in the same message. They're all coordinated. They all sing from the same sheet of music. They get, it's like they get the, the, the memo every day and it starts from, it used to be, you know, from Rush Limbaugh on down or whoever it was in the back rooms that sent it to Rush and then everybody else, that was the same thing. Now it's Tucker Carlson, it's, it's Laura Ingram, it's Steve Bannon, it's, you know, name them. But they all sing from the same sheet of music. They make the same accusations and they have all this money going to these causes that help fund this. And Democrats do not sing from the same sheet of music when it comes to messaging things that matter. Republicans, like you said, it's you're a groomer now. That's the whole thing with that. Um, you know, what's the buzzword of the week? Just, you know, pick one. Whoa. Woke, right, or CRT. By the way, it just and, means kind. Yeah, it's. I got into this uh, d debate about what woke means um, when I was on The View the last uh, time before this one. And I said, it doesn't matter what I think it is. It matters how people perceive it. And Republicans have defined what woke means. So now it has a negative connotation, however it intended when it started. So the Democrats don't seem to be able to have a central messaging committee. <laughs> I had to use the term central committee because that has ne it has negative connotations. But you know what I mean? There's not a central yeah. brain trust where everyone is, is singing from the same sheet of music. And that is problematic because Republicans exploit it. They exploit that. There's a reason though, right? Republicans can be on message the way they are because the, the they have a structural advantage. So they don't need to appeal to anybody. But, you know, straight white, straight white men, pretty much, um, Christian, sorry, straight white Christian men uh, and women who are totally cool with not being treated as second class citizens. Um, and, and Connie, like for us, the problem is we, the, the Democratic Party has had to become a bigger tent because the Republican Party has pushed so many people out as they become more and more extreme and again, they know they do not have to win over a majority of voters in the way Democrats do. So, you know, there's there's that problem. And the other thing I want to ask you, well, both of you about, you know what, Connie, start there. And then I have a question. <laughs> like, so right. like, like, you guys are so friggin brilliant that it's very hard for me not to ask you 500 questions. <laughs> I'm going to start with that. The, that kind of messaging disadvantage Democrats also have. We are never going to have a Democratic Party that has a single message. It's by definition Herding a different cats. party than that. Pardon me? <laughs> Herding cats, yes. It, I mean, you will get five different positions on Medicare and when you should when we should be able to opt in is you know this and uh, universal health care. That is something to celebrate about the party. I think, but it can be something that is quite worrying when we think about how to reach voters. But again, I'm going to go back to who are we fighting for? There are many different underrepresented groups in America that you could argue that's what it means to be on the left. That's who we're fighting for. That can be a universal message, even as it's unique to one group after another. One of the things I hear from both of you as we're talking about this, and I hear it a lot out in the world, is that despair that it's so overwhelming that if you care about everything you feel so small in the world right and i've talked a lot more in recent months about the concept of staggered breathing where either of you ever a choir or a band you know yeah. the concept of it where you can't it's impossible for you to hold the long note all by yourself right and mm -hmm. so you take turns mm -hmm. and sometimes mary is going to hold the note so tara and i can breathe right then tara and i step up and we're going to hold the note so mary can take a breath I really think that works as a concept 
hmm. in terms of political activism. You don't have to be in every fight. And when you need a break, there are enough of us out there, we will hold the note for you. What's important is to figure out where you want to start. And I, I just gave the commencement address at Denison University a couple of weeks ago. And um, I had asked students ahead of time, because I've been talking to a lot of students, what do you need to hear? And they said, we're, we're exhausted, COVID, right? I, I hear that from my own students all the time. They keep telling us to go out and do the next big thing. And what, where could we possibly make a difference after what we've been through? They're still trying to recalibrate and redefine who they are. I say start small, but because there's no such thing as a small thing once you commit to it. It gets bigger in your world and you, your influence sure. becomes greater. And I think that's a really empowering message for a lot of people out there who are, who are exactly, as you said, one thing after another after another. Just the shootings alone in Buffalo and in Texas and all these in Philadelphia. I mean, you can feel like nothing is going to make a difference. But if you decide you pick your issue, you pick that one issue and you get on that horse and you're going to ride it, you can really make a difference. And I think that's one of the ways Democrats can reach out to voters, right? We don't expect you to fix everything. We want you to trust. They have to earn their trust, right? They have to earn the trust. And one of the ways they do that is by empowering the, the average voter by, I hate the word average, by yeah. empowering yeah. voters, helping them yeah. understand all that might be within their control. And again, I go to connecting the dots that the January 6 hearings, let us connect the dots. There is so much they're going to be. I will say this, I, and you, you both might disagree with me on this. I'm a little nervous about all this uh, reporting about what a production it's going to be and how they brought in uh, former TV exec and stuff. If that doesn't ring every cynical bell for a lot of people, and it makes it didn't. sound, pardon me? I thought they did not do that. Oh, oh, no, the they had a big story on it. I think it was, what, Tara, was it today? You seem to be knowing what I... Yeah, oh, yeah. It was James Goldston, the former head of ABC News that they brought yes. in and who was fired from ABC News. And, um, you know, he's known for big, elaborate productions. He he was the producer with Martin Bashir when they had that whole big Michael Jackson thing. Like, oh, that's and right. And so... You know, it, I mean, I understand the importance of of grabbing the attention of the American people to try to make it a little sexier so they'll pay attention. Yeah. But that is a terrible leak. They never should have had, you know, that that we should not know that because it just handed over to the opposition all of the talking points they need to criticize process as opposed to the content of what's actually going on. So that was and a the watch huge parties. strategic mistake. Yeah, it's, it's talk a, of 90 watch parties. It makes it sound like a sporting event. Um, yeah, I'm I'm really unhappy about that because I want people to watch it because they really should care about the future of the country. Right. Absolutely. And I think there are ways to get them to do that. I'm glad we're going to have a, the first one will be in the evening. I think it starts at yep. eight Eastern yes, time. And then next week, the, the first one starts at 10 a.m. Eastern time. So you grab different audiences. Um, yep. I, I just hope they stop all conversation about the production value of this. Well, they're all, not going to. Fox News, well, they're, they're, they're going to find Fox whatever News they can. Are. I mean, it's, yeah. it's horrific. And it also doesn't help that the New York Times is framing it as, you know, Democrats helping their messaging for the... No, this isn't about messaging right. to help, you know, get voters to the polls in the midterms. This is about what happened when this radicalized group of people who were radicalized, by the way, by the guy in the Oval Office tried to overturn the results of a free and fair election yeah. and created seditious conspiracy. But uh, so, but that's uh, what they need to frame it, right? That's how they need to frame yeah. this. They need to yeah. not mince words about what the hell happened that day. Why and didn't anybody call us? I mean, seriously. I, I well, I do you trust know, Jamie Raskin on this. I do I, trust. Oh, Jamie. he's he's fantastic, and I'm I thrilled do, yeah. to see that he is, uh, you know, a part of this. You know, Jamie Raskin is um, an, an absolute impeccable of impeccable character and knowledge Agreed. and a compelling storyteller. And it's and, and I'm thrilled that he's there. It's a little bit different than the first impeachment where things were a little bit lost and in disarray. And this time you have folks who have a, a command of the facts. They have their 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 commitment to this country is unquestionable. And you just seem. You just there's just it says something about you if you're attacking Jamie Raskin's integrity on this. Absolutely. So that's a good point, Connie. Um, yeah, you know, and I have I, to be 
uh, sorry, I have to be honest. No. I mean, it's not that there's anybody on this committee that I don't have, I, you know, respect sure. the committee. Well, but some are better than communicators than others. Absolutely. On in, my, in my moments of despair, I think, wait a minute, Jamie Raskin is on that committee. There has to be a good reason for X, Y, or Z, and it makes me feel better. So yes. I'm completely on the same. On um, that point, Mary, maybe. I think it was Martin Luther King that said we have to accept finite disappointment, yes. um, but never lose infinite hope, right? Exactly. And I kind of feel like that's, that's a where perfect we, quote. That's where that we is are. Perfect. <laughs> it is a perfect that quote. It is perfect. Yeah. And it it you know connects me back to um, something both of you made me think of earlier. The uh, anti-democratic forces in our country have always been really good at co-opting language and symbols and things like that. And we need to we need to put a stop to that. Um, they've taken away the word patriotism from us. They've taken the flag from us. And we need to um, we need to hang on to those things with both hands. First of all, anybody who flies the American flag, the Confederate flag and a swastika um, does not deserve to uh, one, fly the American flag or to claim to be a patriot. Um, but it's fascinating how effective that's been because, you know, I hear the word patriot and I kind of like the uh, hairs on the back of my neck stand up because I, I it's become so associated with those people who fly, you know, I'll Trump give you an example. The their pickup I'll, truck. I'll give you an example. So I was in Home Goods over the weekend, and we're we like to celebrate holidays. We we're, we always overdo things. We big we do a big Christmas village and like turn our house into a Christmas wonderland every Christmas holiday. We decorate for uh, Valentine's Day and Easter. We still I'm 46 and I still color eggs with my mom and my husband. Like it's <laughs> like we're ridiculous. So so Fourth of July is a big deal in my household because I grew up in a law enforcement family. My grandfather was captain of our local police department. He was in the department for 40 years. He was a volunteer fireman for 71. Annual Fourth of July parades were a big deal in my hometown in Paramus, New Jersey. So my grandfather marched in every parade from 1947 until 2016 when he passed away 10 days later. He was in a wheelchair, okay? Like the police department wheeled him because he wanted to make sure he never missed a parade. And then he passed away 10 days later at 90. God bless you, Gramps. But anyway, so 4th of July is a big deal. So I'm in Home Goods and I see all these really cute 4th of July things. And some of them say, you know, like, God bless America or, you know, like, God bless our country. And I would never have hesitated to get some of those things before. I hesitated and said, I don't know if I want to display this because of what people might think I'm associated with for the exact reason that you just said. And That's I right. caught myself going, get the hell out of here. I'm not gonna let these people, like I had this whole conversation in the aisle of home goods, staring at this 4th of July stuff with these phrases that were, were you know, I'm pr like proud American and all yeah. of those things that I would have never hesitated to buy and display before that made me pause for a second because of that. And I said, no way am I going to let these sons of bitches stop me from being a proud American and display that because they think they own this. No, they don't. Isn't and that incredible though? It's crazy. It is incredible. Yes. Yes. It's How real. Well, I say we own them. I, I, yep, I'm right. a patriot. I, I believe in Absolutely. the first amendment. I believe in elected representation. I mean, I, I've i gone through this in my own early years as a colonist. I was raised a Christian. You know, my mother said being a Christian means fixing yourself and helping others, not the other way around. And for a little bit there, I shied away from owning even that because the far right had co-opted it. And then I started covering yeah. military funerals and seeing these horrible, horrible protests um, mm. outside them. It, it was just, it Westboro, was, and I thought, Westboro, if I do if people like us don't speak up, they exactly. they win. They exactly. get to claim everything. And so, right. boy, Tara, do I understand that standing in that aisle and looking at that stuff. Yep. Sharon and I talk about it, you know, in terms yep. of, I mean, for God's sakes, I'm married to a United States senator and we're talking on a regular basis. What does it mean to be a patriot? Um, yeah. What does it mean to be a public servant? I think journalism is another form of public service if it's done Absolutely. right, if it's That's done right. directly and honestly. And um, it goes back again, I will quote Lucille Clifton, what they call you is one thing, what you answer to is something else, right? It's up to yeah. us to define who we are. And that's a powerful message. To, there are so many Democrats in hiding in more rural areas and some of the areas that are becoming increasingly conservative. I hear from them every week. And yeah. this is not to condemn 
whoever Republicans still exist, the old party that Tara was originally attracted to, right? It's yep. just what who's overtaken their party, who has yes. been allowed to overtake the party. That's who we are objecting to. We're, we have never claimed, not in my experience anyway, that there should be one party in, no, in ever dominance in this, right? What yeah. we are worried about is a party that's now trying to destroy our country. That's right. That's right. A party that doesn't believe in democracy anymore. And to Mary's point, I have been calling it a neo-fascist movement because it's what it is. They are yeah. marching toward authoritarianism. And the yeah. more that people, we should be educating folks and showing them, this is what it looked like in history. We've seen this before. This ain't new. Okay. And it didn't end well for them. And this, and look at the parallels of it now. The parallels are very, very scary, which is why so many historians and students of history and you know political folks that understand these things have been sounding the alarm for so long because we're like, this isn't new. And this is when these types of movements emerge, it's very difficult to turn turn the corner to go back once you go down this road. It is a slippery slope, which is why you know we. Bill Buckley, who was a, you know, a conservative uh, stalwart and very influential in my initial conservative um, development as a college student, he said that conservatives were supposed to be the sentinels in the watchtower, that were supposed to yell, stop athwart history when no one else would. And what happened to that? Where is all of that? How do all these people that ran around with pocket, pocket, um, you know, constitutions and and posturing on the floor about the Constitution and America and the, the Republic and quoting Lincoln and all that, that all went out the window with Don, with Donald Trump went out the window when he violated every single one of those principles that they claim to stand for and that they that they preach to everyone else. And that was all out the window in order to stay in power because they were That's too right. afraid to stand up for it. So obviously they didn't believe any of it. And I refuse to stand there and say that I'll be part of a party or let these people be in a, you know, in a party without uh, accountability for their hypocrisy. If they're not going to stand up for the principles of this country, we're not talking policy differences, we're talking basic principles of democracy. They're not willing to stand up for that. They don't deserve to be in office. And they work for us. We are the ones that make that determination. So that's what I want to make sure that when people feel overwhelmed, to Connie's point about staggered breathing, that's a great analogy. I played clarinet when I was a kid, so I get it. Get um, it. But yeah. the staggered breathing um, is that's what we need to do is, uh, to defend our democracy. It's you know, it's like the the phalanx that you have in 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 battle. You know, you have one, then you have the other. You have layers of defense. When one when one is doing one thing, someone else is doing something else to cover them. It's the same thing. And the more people we recruit the more people that can build, we can build each other up to take it on. So we don't have to take it on ourselves. And I think that's why we all do what we do is to encourage the millions of people who haven't been involved in politics, who haven't decided to get out there in their communities to do something because you can. Every vote matters. Every person matters. Even if it's at your local school board, Republicans understood this. I know I, I helped write the playbook back in yep. the days about grassroots organizing. They understood that. Start at the, the, the school board level or if it's dog catcher, doesn't matter. Organize, get it, get get elected. And then you have allies in those positions and then you move on up and then you have you build a community and coalitions and then you see that what happens as a result of it. And they've just been better at it. And I hope that yep. we see that we can take a page out of that book for and use it for good now instead of for the nefarious purposes that Republicans have used it for, because Democrats have a lot of, they, they have a lot of community organizing prowess and Connie knows this, you know, it, it's there. You just have to harness it and make sure that everyone see, keeps their eyes on the prize and that they don't get discouraged. If you don't get Medicare for all, that doesn't mean you're going to stay home and say, forget it, screw this. I'm not, it's not worth it anymore. Like it's bigger than that because Medicare for all or any other policy doesn't matter if the whole Republic goes down. That's right. Mary, 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 may I ask you a question? No one has been more targeted for opposing Donald Trump than you have. I I think it's safe to argue. Perhaps Hillary Clinton, right? But you, for such personal reasons. And um, I would love to know what you and Tara think about this. The question in my mind all the time is, why does he still have such a hold on so many of these um, members of Congress when it clearly, in governors, when it is clearly starting to hurt them. It, 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 it looks yeah. like it's headed that way in a, in a more, I hope, in a more steep um, output uh, outcome. But I'm just wondering why, why does he still have such a hold? Yeah, um, 
Uh, I'll definitely answer that uh, quickly, Tara, if you want to. And then I have a final question for both of you. But I think it's because they, uh, he showed them um, that you can't, if you're brazen enough, if you lie enough, if you break enough norms, you can get away with it. If you deny and um, commit crimes uh, and pretend to care about America while either, you know, stealing from it or undermining democracy, you can get away with it. And I think they realized that that final, like the, the final uh, domino fell. They're like, oh, we go by that playbook and we can get permanent minority power. Because I think that's the only thing this Republican Party cares about is permanent minority power. I think Mitch McConnell, one of his goals is to turn America into a theocratic apartheid state. Um, so they don't, you know, what's interesting, how many people have been 100% loyal to him and then ended up crashing and burning because he lost interest or he they think he did it right. He, they think he didn't toe the line or he thinks, they didn't toe the line enough. Did anybody learn from that? No, there's still the line around the block of people willing to uh, commit their fealty to him and be 100% loyal because they think that's not going to happen to them. This Republican Party thinks that they're one election away, and by the way, they're not wrong, yes. from permanent minority power. So that's why it's not because they think he's a great guy. I mean, the base is very different from elected Republicans. It's not because they think he knows what he's talking about or anything. He gave them a roadmap and they realized if they're a little bit smarter and a little bit more patient and a little bit less egregious, at least, um, you know, superficially, they will get away with it. That's what the Hollies and the Cottons and the Cruises, and, et cetera, et cetera, are banking on. I mean, and that's you can you can bet that Governor Ron DeSantis is Ron, the one who is who is perfected. I leave him off the list. Yes, Abbott, that's right. But, but listen to to answer that question. I, I agree with you about that. That it is it, it is all about power. They make fun of Donald Trump. The, you know, Mitch McConnell and his people. They can't stand Trump, but he's a means to an end. Yep. They, they, this is about pure political power. We all learn in Political Science 101 that elected officials are single seekers of re-election. However cynical you want to be about that, but if you want to stay in power, you have to do what it takes to get elected. Now, some are more willing than others to compromise themselves in order to achieve that. Um, but it's so it's on, you know, it's, it's a spectrum of where you fall on that. But that's the goal in politics. You don't have power if you're not in office. They saw him as a means to an end, and. The way our primary system is set up, it's different in every state, but That's as long right. as you have closed primaries, then you're going to play to the lowest common denominator of that rabid primary base because they're the ones who vote. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of political behavior, of political cynicism, of pure self-interest that they thought that they could that they could control Trump. Paul Ryan and Mitch and all those guys, they thought, all right, you know, once he gets in. We'll be able to, we know what's going on here. He doesn't really want to be president. He'll just kind of go along with it. How wrong they were. I mean, well, they've been doing that since the Tea Party, right? Tara? Yes, yes. They, they always have. think they can control the monster. That's right. And then they, then they can't. And the monster turns around and eats them. So that's what's happening here with, with Trump. And it's a very fascinating dynamic as we watch how much of a hold Trump still has on the party. He's still the titular head of the Republican Party. And as long as he raise, he has the ability to raise money the way he does and still draws the crowds that he does, which means that people are still get, getting out there and voting. So that means that they have to cater to the play, they have to get past the primary. You saw what happened with Chris Jacobs in New York. He spoke out about AR-15s and or you know and said, listen, we've got to do something. He represented Buffalo. Buffalo. And then what happened? He got slaughtered and said that he had to back out. He's like, you know what? I'm not going to win my primary. I'm, I'm quitting. He's one of many. So some people, they're just political cowards. They're cowards. They're craven political actors that they're unwilling to do the right thing in order to maintain power. And Wait, then they you know just go along to get along. And it's, it's 
now, before it used to just be about, oh, tax rates or a policy difference or whatever. Yeah. Now our democracy is on the line and they still right. weren't even willing to do it. You saw what happened after January 6th. Mitch McConnell gave the speech of his life, of his career on the floor after that. Lindsey Graham and all the rest of them were going on and on about all of a sudden they found their balls again. Well, that lasted for all of one day or half a week. And next thing you know, they were kissing Trump's ass down in Mar-a-Lago because they saw a threat to their power structure. That's and right. That's a, that's a shame. You know what I think's happened, though? Um, they've also learned in the intervening months that one thing that has changed in this equation is that, and I hate saying this so much, Trumpism, so-called, will can definitely survive. Live on past him. Yeah. They don't yes. need him anymore, necessarily. That's right. That's so right. in a classic... The journalist has asked the interviewer the question. I am so sorry. I just, I had you here. I needed to know. What you're going to say. I am so sorry. You're right. I'm a terrible guest. You're right. I'm sorry about that. Is, is that what I said? No, yeah. but oh, I said I it was awesome. Not to do that. Is what I was saying. It was awesome. Uh, so I, one last question. I hope you guys come back. This was, you know, you made me feel better. I've been. Good. I have to say. So this actually made me feel better. It made me realize that there are certain things that I need to work on myself. And, you know, um, but more than that, you give me hope. Um, but one thing that all or well, not all, but elected Democrats uh, or a lot of them anyway, need to run is messaging. And as as part of our mission here is to help them be more effective messengers and to help them with strategy. I I always think it's a good idea to come up with bumper stickers. And I'm not kidding, like I'm going to come up, I'm going to start designing actual bumper stickers with the best for the best ones and, and sell them to raise money for really uh, vital races, like a secretary of state, attorney general, et cetera. Um, so no pressure. <laughs> oh, what is your bumper sticker? If somebody has one, I don't want to like put anybody uh, on a bad spot, but is, if anybody wants to start, that would be great. Does anybody have a bumper sticker that we can help, uh, that will help Democrats um, just kind of hone a message that doesn't require a 30 page white paper? <laughs> well, how about, I'm terrible at headlines. So bumper stickers, I think fall in that category. <laughs> But here's what I'm thinking. Fear is not the answer. Or or maybe hate is not the answer. Vote Democrat. Either um, one of those is because I that is but that is so spot on because that's what they do. They well, Mary, you know what I'm thinking of. And to turn it into rage. In mm -hmm. 2006, I sat in on a bunch of focus groups when Sheriff was running for the Senate for the first time. He's not allowed to sit on any of them, but I sat on it. <laughs> I would hear mothers in suburban, from suburban towns talk about how they thought the next terrorist attack would be on their children's playground. And that's when it really Security first moms. hit me. Yep. How much they play on fear to get people to vote for them. That's why, to be honest with yeah. you, fear is not the answer. It was the first thing I thought of. I love it. Tara? Um, for me, it's a little, it's just like vote as if your life and democracy depends on it, because it does. Because they do, right, absolutely. Or they um, do, whatever the proper grammatical, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> however it fits. We're workshopping, we can edit, yeah. it's fine. It doesn't have to be perfect at the big yes. advance, and it's the message that matters. It has and to be right? active, it has to be active. People yes. have to be told, a call to action all the time. They have to be told or have that something do this or else this will or, happen. Right. Or have something explained. Like my mine tonight isn't so much active as, uh, and, and again, it, it needs to be edited. Um, but it's basically inflation wouldn't be as much of a problem if you made a living wage. <laughs> you know, I have to work on it. I <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> long. Reason inflation is always such a huge issue, by the way, no American president has any control over global inflation is because the minimum wage has been the same since 2009, which is obscene. That's anti-American, like anti-American people, $7 and 25 cents. It's just, you know, how anybody can, since 2009 and think about how much wealth 
that top 1% has accrued over that time, right? So um, part of it is, yes, getting people to act in their own self-interest, which is another thing uh, this Republican Party, well, quite honestly, for a long time, the Republican Party has been really good at, at mobilizing people to vote against their yes. self-interest. Cognitive uh, dissonance is a hell of a drug. <laughs> right? Oh, how God. about rich people don't want you to vote? I mean, I'm just trying to figure out if we're, how to hone that message a little like bit. Rich well, as the as I mean, the resident capitalist here, <laughs> that, I don't know that that is the that's not the answer because you don't want to punish people for legitimately being successful. There's another mm -hmm. way right. to to approach that where there are certain inequities, and I I don't disagree with that. But I don't want yeah. I don't like the idea of the class warfare stuff because I don't think that that helps the situation. Because then you feel like you're punishing success, and, and you tell people live the American dream and you can be successful, but then we don't want to demonize those who are. So I, it's a, that's a tougher message. That's a tougher message. You yes, can't on, on, on a, on a I'll stop sticker. addressing, I'll stop addressing <laughs> class warfare the minute they stop waging it. But you know yes. what? And well, I there agree you go. with you. Fair enough. I agree with you. But, but the, the reason it's difficult is because there's this myth of the self-made person. There's no such thing. There is no person in this country who has become fabulously wealthy who hasn't been helped at every step along the way by the government. Right. And then they become anti -government. My grandfather's a perfect example. He received hundreds of millions of dollars of taxes, of subsidies from the United States government, and then resented the fact that he had to pay taxes. Right. That's yeah. the problem. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That's so, different. That's different. Yeah, but that's what, I think that's what, yeah. that's what we're talking about. That's a structural, about. the way things are structurally problematic yeah. and so but it's also, about access to opportunity versus right you know other things but anyway and the war is being waged by the devosses and the mercers that's and for Addisons, sure right so and you know i'm sorry i could go on forever with you guys. <laughs> i'm sorry i like i literally could talk to you what actually here it is here's here's the bumper sticker it's my phrase kick ass and carry on there you go <laughs> vote kick, kick ass. ass and carry on kick vote <laughs> Vote Democrat. There you go. Oh my goodness. Uh Connie Schultz, Tara Sedmeyer, this this was phenomenal. I, I so appreciate the work you do, your willingness to put yourselves out there, your patriotism, um, and the fact that you understand what's at stake, because a lot of people don't and and I, I don't mean they don't as a criticism. I I mean they don't because they don't have the luxury necessarily of paying attention and to have messengers as eloquent and as committed to American democracy as you are is such a gift. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your work. And I really, really hope uh, we get to talk again soon. Thank well, you, Mary. Thank as you, are Mary. you, my friend. Yes, thank you. very much together. so. <laughs> All right. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us for another strategy session. And thank you to my wonderful guests, Connie Schultz and Tara Setmeyer. Uh, you can join us again on Thursday uh, for the Mary Trump show, which is at youtube.com slash politicon 7 p.m eastern 4 p.m pacific i have an absolutely extraordinary guest uh joining me thursday to talk about the state of play to preview the january 6 hearings you are absolutely not going to want to miss this show i promise you and next Tuesday, of course, again, will be another strategy session with a phenomenal panel. That's youtube.com slash Politicon, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. And while you're on YouTube, please follow Politicon, like the episode, and ring the bell uh, because that will make sure you will then be ensured to be notified whenever a new episode of The Mary Trump Show drops. You can also, of course, 
fo uh, follow us or listen to us, I'm sorry, on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And uh, while you're there, please give us a five-star review because it really does help people find the show. And uh, with guests like this, we really, really do want to get the word out. Uh, we have 154 days left before the midterm elections, and there is everything at stake. Thank you so much again for being here. I really appreciate all of you. Um, in the meantime, stay safe and be kind.